the schedule, you can look over on the chalkboard and we have kind of our lineup for all the um, talks coming up. So next week will be Jake, like um, Lauren, like Lauren husband. So um, today, this is a really fun topic. We're gonna be talking about in a little microcosm of dieting, can we somehow preserve muscle mass and metabolism? Okay, so that's the question that we're gonna be shooting to answer today, okay? And I want to be interactive, this isn't a lecture, so if anyone's confused about anything or has any questions, just stop and ask me, and we'll kind of go from there. So, um, hey, Lauren. Hi. <laughs> All right, so I'm not a mean person, and I made a meme. <laughs> myself and I've had clients to say this too but um, people will come in and they'll be like yeah I want help with nutrition and all I'm looking for is I just want to be toned and lose weight and I'm like okay <laughs> this is what I feel like <laughs> because it's so nuanced and there's so many factors that go into play when you try to lose body fat and then get toned which is essentially build muscle right so um, just wanted to start out with that meme okay and then this is the question that we're going to answer today so I want to pull out two things from this question and then the question is at what point can we burn the most amount of fat and then protect these two important things our metabolism and our muscle mass okay so we're going to pull out metabolism and muscle mass for a second and we're going to talk about why they're important and why we want to protect them okay and I want to set up some context here just so everyone's kind of aware um, the context is going to be in a dieting phase Okay, because most people that I've met with are telling me I just want to lose my last 10 pounds of COVID weight or um, I want to lose, you know, whatever I gained over quarantine or whatever like that. Or the last 10 pounds I'm trying to lose my whole life, right? So this is in a context of dieting, okay? Um, so the first thing we're going to pull out is metabolism. So for all of our purposes today, we're going to be talking about basal metabolic rate because metabolism is a lot more than just our BMR. But can anyone define BMR? Does anyone know kind of what it is? Um, what it is? is that what our body like needs to, like, if we're just lay in bed and breathe all day, <laughs> that's what um, right. like our body would need to uh, do that to function. 100%. So like if you got, so if Amanda got COVID, had to go to the hospital, laid in the hospital bed all day, and a nurse waited on you hand and foot, you didn't need to get up to go to the bathroom, they brought your food to you, you laid in the bed, the amount of energy that is required for your life-sustaining functions. So think circulation, oxygenation and ventilation, and then core body temperature. So that's these three pictures up here. So nothing else, no fidgeting, no um, getting up to get water, just life-sustaining functions, okay? So why is it important? Why, why is it important for, to protect our metabolism in the context of a diet? Like why do we care if our metabolism is damaged? Because if the metabolism is damaged, then all those three aspects are going to be damaged as well. Right. That and hey, good. and we all want to burn the most amount of calories just by being alive, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to protect metabolism and maximize the amount of calories we can burn just by existing. Okay. So that's why we care about it. Okay. And this is incredibly nuanced. Our BMR, it's not just based on our height and weight. It's how much muscle mass we have. It's determined by our training history. So um, how long we've been working out and um, hormones play a huge part in our BMR. So I can't dive into all that today, but just know it's, it's incredibly nuanced, okay? Um, do, who knows the uh, organ that basically regulates metabolism? Does anyone know? Thyroid? Yes. So, um, Judge, you can share if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm about how you have yeah, part of it removed. Oh, yeah, I only have half thyroid. Right. So, yeah. Oh, Judge. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I just kept like, just telling everyone you're going to do it. She's my twin. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so people who are hypo or hyperthyroid, that's low or high metabolism, right? So, the hormones um, play a huge part in our BMR. Okay, so moving on, um, we're going to also pull out muscle as a part of the question, why do we want to protect lean muscle? And many reasons why, but I just want to give y'all an analogy. So we have pink man and blue man up here. If I'm walking, I'm walking. Okay, pink man and blue man. So um, all other factors being equal, we're just gonna assume this is a little microcosm of the world. 
they have the same genetics, they have the same training history, they have the same hormone levels, everything's the same. They're both 200 pound males, six feet tall, okay? So we have our pink man right here, he has 20% muscle mass, and then our blue man has 50% lean muscle mass. Who's gonna burn more calories? Right, so all, with all other factors being equal, the person with more muscle mass is gonna burn more calories, and we want that, right? Um, and even just from a longevity standpoint, muscle is protective, like we want muscle, it helps us keep our independence, and we'll talk about that more later. This isn't just aesthetics and how many calories can we burn, you know? Um, but muscle burns fat, we've all heard that, right? So these two things are very important, muscle and metabolism. And it is kind of a trick question because um, it's very difficult to lose body fat and gain muscle mass or preserve muscle mass at the same time. I just want to preface with that. It's not something that's just like you figure it out and you automatically can do it. Um, but there is a sweet spot. Um, and this graph is kind of just showing at some point, depending on where we start with how much body fat we have, some people may be able to lose just body fat for a while before it cuts into a their muscle mass. But some people may start where they're losing body fat and muscle mass at the same time. So we're going to talk about kind of where the sweet spot is in terms of not hurting uh, metabolism or muscle mass. Okay, so a lot going on in this slide, but we're going to talk a little bit about um, what y'all have all probably heard me say, a calorie deficit, right? I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with that, okay? And if we're talking about in the context of a diet, a diet is a calorie deficit. Right, that's the only way we burn fat or muscle. So I've told, I know I've told some of y'all this, I've told Clint, but everything about this equation right here, this we'll talk about, is catabolic. So if you know, does anyone know what catabolic means? Um, Chemistry, they're like, is it breaking down or something? Right, right. I don't know what's breaking down, I just. No, it, it's breaking down. It's like okay. you have a circle and it's broken down into a little particles or an orange. Like that's not a good analogy, but you cut it into slices. Um, another question, throw it back to high school chemistry. What is the first law of thermodynamics? Does anyone know? Energy's not created or destroyed. Yes, good job. So energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only be stored or transformed into a different state, okay? The reason that's important is because our bodies are an isolated system, okay? So I'm gonna use an analogy of um, me my Starbucks cup. So this cup is an isolated system. And if I input 1,000 units of energy into this system and I take out 500, how much is left? 500. 500, right. So I had to remove 500. And then the, in the same way, if I, if I input, um, let's say, 1,000 into my remaining 500, I have 1,500 now, right? So in the same way our body, like this cylinder, Anything we put in, our body has to handle it. So it's not like that energy just evaporates. It's either going to be burned or it's gonna be stored. And our bodies handle an excess by storing it where, primarily? Does anyone know? Fat cells, right. Which is, a, which is a good thing. Like Our bodies are incredibly resilient and they're made in a specific way to do that, it's just, in the society we live in, where everything is just in abundance, then we can overdo it, right? So um, our body, just, I like y'all to know kind of why, the why behind things, but our body's gonna store that excess energy primarily in our fat cells, but there's also, um, it can also be stored in the form of glycogen, which I'm sure y'all heard of before, um, and that's like your energy reserve in the form of carbohydrates. So that's stored in your liver and then your skeletal muscle. So when you'll hear people say like, you need to replenish your glycogen stores by eating carbs, that's what they're saying. It's, a, it's another storage depot. But once that's full, then we go and we spill over into the fat cells, okay? So, um, let's see. Okay, so everything about this catabolic equation means that we're breaking things down, either fat or muscle. So what we have to do is we have to insert in something anabolic if we want to protect our metabolism and protect our muscle mass, okay? And if you've heard of anabolic steroids, what does that, what do those do? Those build. build up your muscle, right? So anabolic steroids, just like an anabolic stimulus, is gonna help mitigate this equation, okay? 
So there's two anabolic things that are going to help us protect the good, the good stuff, our muscle and our metabolism, is protein and resistance training. Okay? So the good thing is for most of us, well, most of us work out, most of us in this room are CrossFitters, so we can check off resistance training, right? If you're coming and working out at Landon, if you're doing other stuff, it, it can work great as well too, but we're all doing resistance training for the most part. And then protein, this is what I've harped on with most of us, why I want you to eat more protein. Y'all are probably like, why do you care so much about protein? It's because it's the anabolic stimulus that that's gonna protect the good stuff, okay? So, if you have any questions, please stop me. Um, or warm me up. Okay, so we're gonna do just a little crash course on inter daily energy requirements, just because I like y'all like to know, okay? Um, so I'm gonna take my computer over here for a second. But um, does, is everyone familiar with the term maintenance calories? What, what that means? Okay, so this scale right here, um, when the scale is balanced, that's the same as if you're eating the total amount that you need to not gain or lose weight in a day. So those are your maintenance calories. If you're eating in a surplus more than your body's expending, you're going to gain weight. If you're eating in a deficit, you're going to lose weight. So the scale would be tipped in a different direction. Okay? So I can't hold this in my so this is the equation that I'm going to explain for a second. TDEE stands for total daily energy expenditure. Okay, so that's the total amount of calorie that our body is burning in a 24-hour period. Then we have BMR, which we've talked about, basal metabolic rate, the amount of calories you burn just by existing to keep your uh, life-sustaining functions going. Okay, then these other things are the, are the factors that people uh, don't really know about and they also become incredibly individualized. Okay, so for general purposes today, I'm gonna to try and explain it as best I can, but um, it's incredibly nuanced and that's where ongoing coaching can be beneficial if it's something you wanna get really specific with. But um, TEF stands for the thermogenic effect of food. Okay, We'll talk about that briefly in like three slides from now. But uh, basically the different macronutrients that we have, protein, fat, and carbs, they require different varying levels of energy to digest, absorb, and store, okay? So we have protein, fat, and carbs. They're all ranked differently in terms of how many calories your body expends to handle them, right? We'll talk about that in a second. And then we have um, exercise, um, energy expenditure. That's how many calories you burn in formal exercise. So if Lauren comes to a one hour CrossFit class, it's how many calories she burns in that one hour period. And then you could also add in kind of the afterburn effect with high intensity interval training, you're gonna burn more calories after you're done working out. And then we have NEAT, which is non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is how many calories you burn like fidgeting around or when Sean's like tapping his toe when he's typing on his computer and it annoys me. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, and then like you get up and you go get water at the office um, or just sitting and standing, like all the stuff that you're doing throughout the day, like your activity level basically, okay? So we're just gonna do a little example problem so that y'all can kind of um, see where, how we factor in how many calories you need to eat in, okay? So BMR, um, you can get this tested in the clinic. I know some of you have done it before. Um, but they either do direct or indirect calorimetry where they can either measure body heat or um, the gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide and get an estimate of what your basal metabolic rate is. Or not estimate, it's pretty accurate. But for estimation purposes, um, we're going to take people's body weight in kilograms and multiply it by 20%, which is about, it's the multiplication factor um, to estimate how many uh, calories you are going to burn by your height and weight. So we're gonna take an 80 kilogram male, I'm just gonna, 80 kilogram male, and we're gonna multiply that by 0 0.20, okay? All right, so he's 176 pounds, or no, not 0.20, we're gonna multiply it by 20, okay? And then we come out to get 1,600 calories This is BMR, okay? Then we factor in the thermogenic effect of food, Okay, it depends on the breakdown of his diet and how much protein he's eating in a day, how many calories and how many fat. But typically about 10% of your daily energy requirements are gonna come from the thermogenic effect of food. So we're gonna multiply his BMR by 0.1, okay? So 1600 calories times 0 0.1, that gives us 160 calories. 
from the thermogenic effect of food. Okay? And then exercise energy expenditure. The estimate in terms of how many people burn, it totally depends on how long you work out, but we're gonna say for an hour of exercise, the range is about 250 to 500 calories, depending on what you're doing, okay? For all of us, most of us doing CrossFit, we're gonna be on the higher end of that. So we're just gonna say he's, he's a CrossFitter, um, 80 kilogram CrossFitter, so he's gonna burn on the high end, which is 500 calories, okay? 500 calories, and then non-exercise, Activity thermogenesis, that's about a 250 to 500 calorie range as well. And we're going to say he's an accountant. He has a sedentary job, so he's pretty much just getting up to get some water. Um, so he's going to be in the low end of that range, which is 250 calories. Okay? So if you add all this up, his total energy expenditure in a 24 hour period is 2,510 calories. Okay? So that's what he would eat to not gain or lose weight. Right. I'm sorry that that was pretty scientific, but um, it's just interesting to know. And then once he finds that number, he can calculate his macronutrients from there. Okay. So why do we care about that? Um, there are three principles of fat loss. If I had to pull out the three most important that I could tell y'all, if, if your goal is to lose any body fat, which is, I, I think it's totally fine to have a fat loss goal, but I'm not trying to say that that's, the only goal that we should have, okay? Um, but if you're trying to lose fat loss, the three most important principles are to go really, really slow. That's gonna give you um, a really good chance of not cutting into muscle mass or damaging your metabolism, okay? So um, it's just hard in a world where we can get like an Amazon package on our doorstep within like 24 hours to not wanna go really, really fast and get it immediately. But if we wanna do it the right way and we want it to be sustainable, have to take a long game approach, okay? Um, and then the second principle is anytime you're dieting, we, un we know that the calories in, calories out argument. We know we're gonna have to eat less, but don't decrease calories in the form of protein, okay? That's the anabolic stimulus that we want, right? So take calories away from carbs and fat, but not from protein, okay? And we'll talk a little bit about how much protein really briefly, we're almost done. Um, but the third factor is resistance training. If you read the literature on losing body fat and maintaining muscle mass, all of the controls are in, most most of the controls are in a population who resistance trained, and so that's good for us because we do it right. Um, and if you can do it four times a week, that's ideal. That's kind of like the gold standard. Um, okay. All right. Why is high protein effective? Um, many reasons, other than just the anabolic factor of protein. If you're eating a higher protein diet, we know that protein is the most satiating nutrient. So does anyone know what satiating means? Right, so if most diets fail because we're hungry, it's a really great solution. Eating a high protein diet, we're gonna stay fuller for longer and we know that hunger is what makes us fail, that's a really good benefit of eating high protein. We also know that protein is what's required to maintain muscle mass. So we're checking that off the list. And then also um, going back to the thermogenic effect of food, protein is the highest nutrient on the uh, rankings or the scale in terms of how many calories you burn per macronutrient. Okay, and we'll talk about that on this next slide. So this is a graph I pulled out from a research study um, and it's breaking down different diets. So like the keto diet's in here, um, high carb, low carb, there's a lot of different diets factored in, but I cut it off so we wouldn't um, harp or focus too much on that. Um, but basically what I want you to get out of this is this is a high protein diet right here. Because you can see protein is the middle one, 40% protein is highest. They're burning, whoever is eating this diet is burning about 325 calories just from the thermogenic effect of eating high protein. Okay, so that's pretty interesting, right? If we know we can eat a certain macronutrient to keep us fuller for longer, and we're burning more calories just to digest and absorb and deal with it, that's a really good benefit, right? Um, you've probably felt the difference in eating a chicken breast. Let's say you just had a chicken breast versus a bowl of cereal. Let's say they're both 300 calories. How much quick, how, how quickly do you get hungry after the cereal in comparison to the chicken breast? Right? As soon as I eat the last spoonful. Right, right. 
And then it, you can factor in blood sugar levels and the spikes and all that that makes us want to crave more food. Um, and we could get into that, but we're not going to. But basically, it's really interesting to see a high protein diet burn more calories. So, all right, um, moving on, I just want to quickly talk about a study um, that I recently came across from a guy named Bill Campbell. He's um, very well researched. Sean knows who he is. He's a, he's a researcher at the University of South Florida. He has a PhD. And um, his population that he studies is like us. It's people that aren't bodybuilders, but that want to look good and have a good physique. And so within a maintainable lifestyle, he studies populations that their goal is just to look really good and be healthy. Okay. So that's the context of this study. And it was in, the study was in women, um, but you can find a lot of other research out there uh, as it pertains to men in the same category as well. But basically there's two groups. He took, over the course of eight weeks, he took um, two groups of women. One group, he told them, you're gonna eat high protein. So that's this group over here, which is about 1.1 grams per pound of body weight. Okay, so that's a lot of protein. Like the 125 pound female was eating 140 grams of protein a day. Okay, and then he took another group and said, "You're going to eat half of that." Okay, you're going to eat low protein, so you're going to eat about 70 grams. And some of the he he, he made this study very controlled. So he like told them, "You're going to resistance train four times a week, and we're going to watch all your workouts, make sure you're all doing the exact same workouts, um, same reps, everything like that." So it's pretty controlled. And these are his findings. The findings is that in the high protein group of women, they gain three times more lean muscle mass than the low protein group. And that makes sense, right? But what made it really significant is that they also lost 33% more fat than the high protein group. And it's not taking into account their training history or you know all of that stuff, but they made sure that these were just normal people who weren't bodybuilders or anything like that. So that's really, really fascinating. And what was really cool about this study is that the high protein group of women were actually eating 425 more calories per day than the low protein group. But the caveat is that those 425 calories were all in the form of protein. Okay, so you might be thinking, okay, well this flies in the face of the calories in, calories out argument, right? Because if they're eating more than they're consuming, aren't they gonna gain weight, right? Um, and that's what made this study so interesting is that with all of those excess calories coming from protein, you have the thermogenic effect of food come in. So they were able to burn more calories even though they were eating more. Okay, so it's really fascinating. Um, all right, so in eating the high protein diet gave them about a 25% increase in calories burned um, from the thermogenic effect of food, which is really interesting. Okay, any questions about that study? Or, yeah. Yes, I have a good question. So, sometimes, like when I eat protein, normally along with it comes carbs and fat. It's hard to eat like just egg whites or just right. uh, flatwaters or like just chicken. So, like, how do you kind of eat a high protein diet and make sure you're not adding in a lot more carbs and fat? Yeah, so like you wouldn't typically eat, I don't ever really eat just protein unless it's like a protein shake. You just would make sure you structure your day where all of your meals have around like 20 to 25 grams of protein and your snacks all have protein and then you're drinking like a post-workout protein shake, right? So you just space it out according to how much you need in the day. Um, but if you're ever getting to the point where you have to eat a chicken breast at night, you haven't, after dinner, yeah. you haven't spaced it out that okay. usually, so, yes. I've heard people say before that your body can only um, metabolize so much protein at one time. Yes. Do you think that's, is that true? No, so like the 30 grams in an hour type thing? Yeah, so um, there's been a lot of studies that actually show that, but then a lot of studies that also I've heard of that say that that's not true. So it's kind of like, I'll, it's under question. But if you think about your digestive system as kind of like a slow, like when you eat food, it's a slow drip. So it's not like I eat a chicken breast and it goes straight to my bicep, right? So if you think it's kind of like drip. That'd be great. <laughs> okay. um. So like your body, it takes time to, like once you chew and like masticate and your food is like broken down, it takes time for the um, stomach to like slowly release bits and pieces into your intestines. So in all reality, you don't absorb it all of a sudden in 30 minutes. 
So if it's gradually happening, like a slow drip coffee, then that kind of shows it doesn't really matter if you eat, you can probably digest more than 30 grams in an hour if it's slowly releasing, but um, it's kind of under question. So per, I mean, personally, I think it's better just to try and eat and let your body handle it how it handles it. Eat as much as you can whenever you can um, and your body will handle it. So that's a good question. Um, okay, so just an important note on that study, if those women who had great success, who lost body fat percentage, um, and, uh, and, and they got stronger, if the women, the high protein group, if they had stepped on a scale, would they have felt that they failed or lost? Right, because they lost body fat percentage, but the scale probably stayed the same or even went up. So it's really important to note that, especially for us during this challenge, like that's why I say take progress pictures, take measurements. If you're a guy or girl and you like to know your waist size or you have a um, some clothes that you want to fit back into. Use those as markers. Use body composition scans, um, like our body fat percentage calculator. You have to step on a scale for me to get that. And I mean, weight is important to kind of note, but I all this to say, the scale's not going to give you an accurate representation of your success. Um, so all those women would have felt the same. So um, take note of how your clothes are fitting and all. All right, so I just thought this is funny. I'm going to put Sean on the slide. <laughs> but, um, <Not> <laughs> he's so official. <laughs> Both of the Go check him out. Um, okay, so how much protein should I be eating? Again, the context of a diet phase. Okay, once you get into maintenance, this is going to change. This is where uh, it's hard to generalize. You have to talk to a coach specific to you. But in diet phase, the minimum is about 0.75 grams per pound of body weight. Okay, so for Sean, he's 200 pounds. I'm 195. Okay. <laughs> 195. She wouldn't break it down and to 195 because 200 is easier. <laughs> okay, so the minimum Sean would eat in this diet phase would be 150 grams of protein. Ideally, he would eat about a pound per pound of body, a gram per pound of body weight, or 1.1 is ideal. Okay, so that would put him at 220 grams of protein. That is a lot. And there's a caveat here because if it, if you're not, no one here is obese, but this would not apply in an obese individual, okay? They can't physically eat 300 or 400 grams of protein, okay? So this is in someone who is otherwise healthy or might maybe just slightly overweight, okay? Um, but ideally, you would be around the 220 grams of protein, okay? Um, also, I do want to say, people have asked me before, they're like, what about kidney function? You know, because you've heard people who have kidney disease need to like restrict their protein intake, and that's true. Um, and obviously, like 100% always talk to your doctor, um, especially if you have any type of kidney problems. Um, but overwhelmingly, the literature shows in healthy individuals who don't have pre existing kidney problems, there was no effect or negative effect on kidney damage. Okay, so I just want to throw that out there because people always ask about that. Um, in a high protein diet, there was no effect. All right, so last slide, takeaways. Um, I got this picture off of the, uh, nutri uh, she's a really smart nutritionist in the CrossFit world, she like works for HQ. But basically, the best thing you could do from a long-term perspective and an aesthetic perspective is to build lean muscle mass, right? None of us are getting any younger. And we know that a part of aging is actually, our muscles are gonna break down as we get older. Right, so the best thing we can do is invest in building lean muscle mass. Because in the long term, that's gonna keep us out of the nursing home, that's gonna keep us walking with our grandkids, with our kids, um, and staying as far away as we can from sarcopenia, which is the breakdown of our muscle, okay? So, um, all right, so we know takeaway is you burn more calories at rest um, and with lean muscle mass, and you're just gonna burn more in general, higher PMR, you're gonna burn more calories with each workout because as you're building muscle, you're gonna increase your potential to lift more weights and do better in your workouts, which in turn is gonna make you burn more calories. And then also, um, it just has a big influence in the long term, like I said. So, how do we do this? Show up to your workouts at Landon and, and eat protein, okay? <laughs> so show up to your workouts. So, that's it, and there's some references if you wanna see any of the articles I cited, but any questions? Yeah. yeah. Go back to the slide with Sean. No, <laughs> don't go back to that slide. No. I wish I could zoom in.
No. Um, I tried to get fast, so I wouldn't end us um, too late, but that's all. So I hope that uh, helped. But if you have any questions, let me know. And um, the point of this is really make sure you're. If I've talked to you about eating high protein, this I just wanted to prove to you all why. Okay. Um, yeah, y'all can chill, and I guess Good job. for class. <laughs>